Okay, thanks for joining us for participating in our small acreage webinar today on poisonous plants, specifically focusing on horses. Um, this webinar is made possible by Colorado State University Extension and the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and it's being recorded, so you can, um, after today, you can feel free to take a look and review the webinar on the Small Acreage Management website, and on the chat box, the address is listed. Um, you can take a look at this webinar or lots of other webinars that we've recorded in the past on the archives section. Um, my name is Jennifer Cook. I'm the Small Acreage Management Coordinator for the Front Range in Colorado. And with me is Tony Knight, who's the Clinical Science Professor here at Colorado State University. So Tony will talk for about 50, 55 minutes, and then we'll have maybe 10 minutes or however long we need, really, for question and answer. If you have questions um, or comments while Tony's talking, you can feel free to use the chat box and um, write your questions in, and Tony will address them whenever appropriate, either during his presentation or at the end. Before we get started, I'll bring up a quick survey question to just find out uh, the knowledge of our audience. And the answers are anonymous, so feel free to be very honest. We're just trying to figure out um, what your knowledge is about poisonous plants before the presentation, and then we'll ask you again at the end. So I'll give everyone a few minutes. You can use your mouse and just click the appropriate answer. Okay, it looks like most people are saying they have some knowledge of poisonous plants. So hopefully you'll be experts after listening to Tony. Um, all right, so I guess I'll just turn things over to Tony. So sit back and, and relax and listen to Tony. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, thank you all for tuning in today. And um, I hope that uh, since most of you have got some knowledge of these plants that we'll talk about, uh, you'll be familiar with them. And uh, I also hope there'll be some that... Uh, you're not so familiar with, and uh, we'll obviously learn from that. <clears throat> so I wanted to start off with a couple of uh, generalities here, and and ask you know uh, rhetorically how many question how many horses are likely to be poisoned? How common is it? And um, I'm glad to say that it's not that common. Uh, most of the poisoning we see results from mismanagement in various forms, either overgrazing or feeding uh, toxic plants in the hay inadvertently. Uh, but a well-managed pasture, even if there's some toxic plants there, is not going to be a major concern. <clears throat> uh, as you are well aware, there's uh, the possibility for poisoning any time of year. It's not just summer. And uh, weedy hay is a continual risk. Uh, at any time of year, and so uh, one has to be continually on the lookout for what we're feeding uh, to our horses, and uh, the hay is certainly a, a prime suspect uh, if you suspect plant poisoning. There's a, a variety of risk factors that are, again, I think fairly obvious. Um, starving animals are going to eat anything they can get, and um, time of year has bearing on that. Early spring, late summer, pastures get overgrazed or the plants haven't emerged yet in the spring and they'll eat anything they can get. Um, drought has a similar effect and certainly in Colorado, parts of Colorado, that's a major issue this year. Uh, even uh, snow cover. Uh, one may not think of plant poisoning then but uh, maybe the grass is covered and uh, shrubs sticking up above that are an enticement to the hungry horse. Uh, bringing horses into new environments um, may mean that they eat plants they're not familiar with or uh, too much of a particular plant, and that's a, a major concern. I've often seen uh, questions brought up about uh, what's in the bottom of the hay feeder, and I think most of us are aware we need to clean out the hay feeder pretty regularly because Seeds, plant parts, and so forth tend to gravitate to the bottom, and then you've got the bottom feeder who comes in and cleans out the, uh, the bottom and picks up a lot of seeds. Things like bindweed can be a real problem if it's uh, 
uh, accumulating in the bottom of a feed bunk. So clean them out on a, on a regular basis. How much of a plant of a, of a plant does a horse have to eat uh, to be poisoned? And you'll be glad to hear that, with perhaps one exception I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, um, they have to eat a lot. So a single mouthful is really a problem. And uh, in fact, they can eat pounds of plants uh, in, on a given day or over a period of weeks that um, even though they're poisonous, uh, they dilute out it in their digestive system, the plant, and so it's not a, a major concern. So the, the message I think we all should take home from today, and I hope no one goes out and immediately buys Roundup and nukes everything in the pasture, uh, is that the dose or the quantity of plant makes the poison. So the dose makes the poison. And if we keep that in mind, um, a balanced ration will often prevent any uh, serious poisoning. There is uh, quite a bit of variability in how our different species respond. Um, ruminants, sheep and cattle, uh, probably get poisoned uh, as more often than horses. And um, their digestive systems are different. And so they metabolize the plant toxins differently. Um, and many times, the horses are, are just not affected. A good example, for example, is the uh, problem with nitrate poisoning in, in ruminants, sheep and cattle. Whereas horses can eat those same plants that would be fatal to sheep and cattle uh, without uh, any particular problem. And it's because they have a, a totally di a different digestive system that can manage uh, nitrates. There's a list here of uh, noxious weeds that uh, are uh, actually on the Colorado Department of Agriculture's noxious weed list. Uh, these ones are uh, poisonous. And again, depending on how much they eat, um, will affect them. In fact, we get relatively little poisoning from these plants, uh, with some exceptions, which we'll get to in a bit. But uh, quite a bit of our poisoning results not from noxious weeds, but actually native plants. And you won't find them listed on the Department of Agriculture's uh, noxious weed list. And here's a few of them, things like loco weed and ground or senecio, death camus, uh, many of the sages, milkweed, oak, water hemlock, and so on. Uh, so these are native plants, and um, they actually cause more problems than uh, do the noxious weeds in terms of poisoning. Uh, this is a, a pasture that uh, looks very enticing, um, but all those white flowers there are highly poisonous. And uh, this is not a good pasture to leave horses in because once they've grazed down the grass, they're going to start feeding on other things. And in this case, uh, they might be uh, like this bull here, for example, that was turned out by the owner. And uh, it was early spring. Um, you can see the willows haven't leafed out yet. But next morning, he was laying there dead. And um, what we found was that he'd been eating this plant. And as I always somewhat facetiously say, the, it's easy to recognize because there's always a plant. Uh, by the plant, there's a knife sticking in the ground. So it's quite easy to recognize it when you walk the pasture. But what this plant is, is water hemlock. Um, and this is the most poisonous plant we have in Colorado. It's a native plant. It grows in wet conditions, as the name implies. And literally uh, four or five ounces, a couple of mouthfuls of this would kill an adult horse uh, or an adult cow or a human for that matter. So it's an extremely poisonous uh, native plant. There's several species of this water hemlock that grow across North America. This is the one we have here, Secuta maculata. And as you can see from the map, it's a well distributed uh, native plant in the West. There is no treatment for it. Uh, if they eat it, you usually find them dead. And so it's the one plant to remove from the pasture if you see it grow in there. The other hemlock that um, 
people often confuse or associate with hemlock poisoning is poison hemlock. Now this is a different plant altogether. It was actually introduced from Europe and um, is not as poisonous as the water hemlock, but uh, nonetheless is a weed that we don't like to have growing because it is a prolific seed producer and will spread readily in a pasture. And it, it is uh, certainly very poisonous. The uh, root that you see in the middle there would would be, uh, if eaten by a horse, would cause very serious poisoning, if, if not death. The picture on the right is uh, the uh, other name for this is spotted hemlock. And you can see the characteristic red spots on the, uh, on the stem that helps you recognize it. And uh, those of you into Greek uh, historical perspective, remember that uh, Socrates was given a concoction to drink to execute him, and it was made from the, the poison hemlock. Um, so it's a highly poisonous plant that we should pay attention to and not allow to establish in our pastures. Both of them are, are uh, quite common, and um, one on the left, the poison hemlock, is a weed, and one on the right is a native plant. And unfortunately, there is no treatment for either of them, uh, we're a horse to uh, eat any quantity of Milkweeds. I think we're all familiar with milkweeds. Um, these are native plants. They are uh, present uh, throughout the state. Uh, we have several species. The most common is the showy milkweed shown here. Um, it has kind of a white or pinkish flower uh, with big seed pods and big... Uh, tough leathery leaves that uh, we see growing throughout the state. And uh, it is poisonous, uh, but rarely do animals eat it because it is very unpalatable. And again, if you starve an animal, yes, they will eat it. But uh, horses tend to leave it alone uh, if there's other feed available. Uh, again, on the right is the showy milkweed. But the one that really causes us more problem is the one on the left here with the white flowers. And you'll notice it has very narrow leaves compared to the, the broad leaves of the showy milkweed. And so as a rule of thumb, the narrow leaf milkweeds are the most poisonous and uh, are a problem because they uh, often get into hay meadows and um, could easily be baled in with the hay and cause poisoning. So again, you can see in this particular species the very narrow leaves, typical milk pod, and the white flowers. But it's the uh, narrow leaf species that we're worried about. We've all seen the, uh, the pods when they break open in the fall and release the seeds. Um, certainly they're poisonous uh, at this stage. But on the left is the dried pods in the late summer. And they remain toxic even when dry. So uh, something to keep in mind when you're uh, concerned about problems in late summer. Uh, <clears throat> the milkweeds all contain these digitalis-like glycosides. And so they act on the heart. And probably the first indication that you have a problem is an animal that may show depression. And uh, if a veterinarian listens to the heart, you can hear very irregular heartbeats. And it doesn't take too much, as you can see, about 2% of their body weight to uh, fatally poison an animal. And uh, this wouldn't be difficult to uh, achieve, uh, for example, in a bale of hay, where there's a big patch of milkweed baled in with it. Um, you know, about a third or half of a bale could be a, a serious problem if fed in the middle of winter to, uh, to horses. No treatment for milkweed poisoning. Uh, again, be on the lookout for it, and uh, particularly the narrow leaf varieties. The, uh, I see one comment there. I think the milkweed is a good butterfly habitat, and uh, that is true. The monarch butterflies love the milkweeds, and um, so I tend to leave the broadleafed ones there uh, just because it helps to bal balance the ecosystem in one sense. Narrow leaf varieties, however, um, especially in hay fields, probably need to be uh, sprayed and, and removed. 
Now the picture you have in front of us here is um, a typical scene in some years. Uh, in this case, uh, we haven't had it for a few years now because we've lacked the rainfall, at least in northern Colorado. And um, this is a picture of loco weed. And uh, this would be a high-risk pasture again. If they were turned out there, horses grazing it would uh, potentially run into uh, the risk of poisoning. <clears throat> There are many types of loco weed, or some people call them vetches, or milk vetches. Uh, the two commonest we have are the white one and the purple uh, loco weeds. And they grow from Montana to New Mexico, well distributed in the uh, foothills and the Rocky Mountains, and uh, in some years can become quite prolific in, in the natural prairies or rangeland. There are other types. If you go out eastern Colorado, uh, there's the woolly milkweed, um, woolly loco, excuse me, woolly loco weed. And um, it has these very hairy uh, leaves, and it's typical out on the eastern part of the, of the state. Loco weeds grow in a, a vast geographic area, and uh, there are many hundreds of these different uh, vetches or milk, uh, loco weeds. Um, fortunately, not all of them are poisonous, but uh, the uh, common white one that we see and the purple one certainly are a factor to be concerned with. So here we are again with the two most common species of loco weed we have, the Oxytropus sericea and Lambertii. And the interesting thing is for years we assumed that loco weeds themselves produce the toxin. But we now know that the fungus, that is a fungus that grows in the plant. Uh, you can't see it. It doesn't make the plant look moldy or anything like that. But the fungus lives inside the plant and it produces the toxin. In this case, it's called swainsonine. And so animals grazing these plants at this stage um, pick up the toxin. And uh, this is what causes the problem in the, in the animals that eat it. Poisonous to all animals horses, cattle, or domestic animals. And uh, you, as I say, you can't see the, the, the fungus. Um, you have to look under a microscope to, uh, to see it. And um, I'm going to get the pointer to work. Anyway. Click it again. Click. Oh, okay, there it is. Um, <clears throat> you can see this um, thing snaking through the, the cells here, and this is the, uh, is the uh, fungus growing in amongst the cells of the plant. It doesn't hurt the plant, but it produces a toxin uh, that uh, is a problem to animals that eat it. Uh, horses uh, have to eat probably 15, 20 pounds of loco weed, uh, and they can do that in a day or two. Uh, why? Because loco weed is very palatable. Nutritionally, it's about like alfalfa. It is a legume, high protein. It tastes good, and uh, at certain times, particularly when it's flowering, uh, horses find it very palatable. And then they develop nervous signs, uh, which unfortunately do not uh, respond over time. Once they develop nervous signs, the animal rarely recovers. The picture on the right is a, a foal that's born with crooked legs as a result of a mare eating loco weed in early pregnancy, and it causes deformity of the bones. So it is a liability to allow pregnant mares to graze loco weed uh, in that early part of pregnancy. As I say, it affects all animals. Uh, in context today, we're talking about horses. They could abort if they were pregnant. They develop these crooked-legged foals, and um, the sad part is the adult animal, once it becomes locoed, is, is permanently uh, compromised, and even though they show some improvement, you can't ride them safely, um, and they may end up being a pasture ornament. Uh, they can be bred, but uh, from a working perspective or riding animal, one has to be very cautious once an animal has been locoed. There is no treatment um, once they develop clinical signs. 
So how do we manage around loco weed if it's very common in the pastures uh, that we have? Uh, obviously one can spray to remove the plants. Um, however, remember that the seeds from loco weed can last up to 100 years in the soil. So you may kill the plants now, but you get rainfall next summer and back they will grow uh, because of the seed bank of this particular plant. Other people will spray an area and um, create a safe pasture. So um, if there's a lot of weed growing in, the, in an area, they can move them out, particularly when it's blooming, and put them in the safe pasture, move them back later in the season um, when the animals don't uh, tend to want to eat the plant near as much. Sometimes we get horses showing neurologic signs that could be confused with loco weed poisoning. And perhaps you're sitting there wondering why you're looking at a picture of Van Gogh or the gentleman on his left who looks half asleep and has been drinking a, uh, a glass of uh, green liqueur there, which some of you know is absinthe. And the connection between horses, Van Gogh, and uh, looking like loco weed poisoning is that horses will get poisoned on sagebrush. And sage is, or I should say absinthe, is made from one of the sages. So we can see horses, in, particularly in the fall, when there's an early snowstorm, and they're caught out on rangeland. Um, the grass is covered with snow. They get hungry. They start grazing sage. And after a day or two of eating that uh, almost exclusively, they will become very intoxicated and um, they won't cut their ear off like Van Gogh did, obviously, but they will act kind of crazy and very unpredictable, uh, unsafe to work around, and it's because they've got uh, sage poisoning. Uh, there's, one needs to probably consider all sage potentially poisonous. Uh, the two common ones we see it with is sand sage, which grows out in the eastern plains a lot, and also... Um, the uh, smaller sage uh, that will cause similar poisoning is the fringe sage or sage wart. And this is a plant that's again a native plant, but if you overgraze your pastures, uh, this will become invasive. And again, if horses are hungry, they'll eat the sage, become intoxicated, and um, one might think they've got loco weed poisoning. Fairly easy to diagnose. If they smell of sage, in all probability you're dealing with sage poisoning. And the good part about it is if you take them off the sage, give them good feed, they'll recover. Unlike local weed poisoning where they do not recover from uh, the effects of the local weed. So moving on here, um, here's a sad case. Uh, this was a horse that... Uh, was over on the western part of the, snake, the state, and um, the owners actually were very conscientious. They'd been feeding it all kinds of uh, different feeds, uh, moving it in pastures, but uh, everything they did uh, uh, was to no avail, and this animal got thinner and thinner and, uh, and eventually died. And this is a picture of the pasture it was in, and you'd think there was plenty to eat there. But that is almost entirely... A, a, pasture of Russian knapweed. And this is a noxious weed that's been introduced. It's particularly problematic on the west slope, uh, but we unfortunately have it in plenty of areas on the eastern part of the state, um, in fact in many states now, and it is um, an invasive weed that will pretty well form a monoculture in the pasture. It will kill out everything else, and if you're not careful, um, this will be a serious problem to the horse. So what it does to horses is actually affects the brain so they cannot bite off and chew the food and they will starve to death. It affects only horses. It does not affect cattle, sheep. In fact, sheep and goats have been used to graze it and um, help to control it. And these animals, uh, after eating it for a period of weeks, it's not again a mouthful that's going to affect them. They have to eat it over a period of weeks. And they actually like to eat it. Um, and especially if they're hungry, they're going to eat a lot more of it. And they develop this syndrome of chewing disease. It looks like they're trying to eat, but they have difficulty biting food off, chewing it, 
and swallowing it, and uh, consequently these animals, even though they look like they're eating, they're going to starve to death. The other one that unfortunately has now crept into Colorado in some counties, particularly over in the West Slope, or even some on the uh, eastern part of the state now, uh, is yellow star thistle. And uh, this is a noxious weed. It's on our state noxious weed list, a list. So if you have it, get hold of your uh, uh, weed extension folks and get rid of this. We sure don't want it spreading. But it does the same thing as the yellow, uh, as the Russian knapweed, and it affects the animal's ability to chew food. And once the the brain is damaged, uh, it is permanently damaged, and uh, these animals will will never recover uh, from the toxin that's present in both the knapweed as well as the yellow star thistle. It causes, this is a cross-section of the brain of a horse, uh, that uh, this uh, yellow star thistle poisoning or knapweed poisoning, and the two arrows indicate the points in the brain where this toxin destroys the brain and it will be permanently destroyed and won't recover. And if you want to impress your friends on Friday evening at the bar, you can tell them that it, it causes nigropallidal encephalomalacia. Again, untreatable. We need to recognize the plants to prevent uh, this being a problem in our horses. Again, the Russian knapweed kind of looks like Canada thistle. The difference is that Canada thistle is very spiny. Uh, this plant... Um, as the name implies, nap means hair. It's very soft and hairy. Uh, the yellow star thistle is quite spiny, as you see from the spines around the, the flower there. And you may have heard of other nap weeds, uh, spotted nap weed, diffuse nap weed. Again, these are invasive weeds, but they are not poisonous. As far as we know, they uh, do not cause that poisoning we see in yellow star or Russian nap weed. But if you have these growing in your pasture, one needs to control them because they're invasive and will displace the normal forages and devalue the uh, nutritional value of the pasture. Some of you may live in the higher country, uh, foothills um, up in the Aspen area, and have a plant called bracken fern. Uh, this is a native. It's in... Uh, all the higher elevations, um, often seen under aspen groves, it uh, is a fern that uh, is quite invasive in these areas, and um, it contains some toxins that affect uh, our animal species differently. In fact, it also affects humans, as I'll mention in a minute. In horses, it causes blindness because it has an enzyme, it's called thiaminase, that destroys vitamin B1 which is essential uh, for a normal healthy horse and um, as a result they develop uh, blindness and, and depression. Uh, fortunately they can be treated with an injection of vitamin B B1 and they recover. In, horse, in, in cattle it does a different problem altogether and it causes actually cancer in the, in the bladder of horses. Uh, I keep saying horses. Cattle uh, doesn't cause cancer in horses. Um, in humans, it causes cancer. So uh, you've probably heard of people eating fiddle neck. Uh, you can buy it in some of our high-end um, food stores, and um, it, it, if it's eaten continuously, it can actually cause cancer in humans. But uh, horses, blindness, depression, um, treatable by uh, a vitamin B1 injection. Another plant that uh, I think some of you may be familiar with is, is a is not a weed. It's actually a native plant again, and uh, this can be a problem to horses uh, more often when it's incorporated in hay. This is the common horsetail. Um, it tends to like marshy ground, and um, to the uninitiated, could be easily incorporated in the hay and then fed to animals in the winter time. Um, can cause uh, a vitamin B1 deficiency, much like the bracken fern. So again, the message is check the hay when you 
break open a bale and feed it each day just to see there's not large quantities of this um, embedded in amongst the, amongst the grass. It is treatable, but um, again, when we desire to avoid getting them poisoned in the first place. Some of you live uh, out in the eastern part of the state, uh, have horses out there, and I wanted to briefly mention selenium poisoning because it is a concern to uh, uh, horse owners as well as um, uh, livestock producers. And um, it's a plant that uh, is associated with often areas that have white precipitate, often low-lying areas. And the old-time ranchers and settlers would call it alkali disease because the alkali deposits there. The white stuff there is not selenium, however. That's a salt that precipitates, but usually in these alkaline soils is where we find uh, plenty of selenium. And the map shows you uh, where we have the alkaline soils in, in North America, and these are the areas where we can have um, selenium accumulation in plants because it's present in the soil, and the plants uptake it from the soil and therefore um, expose it to our animals that graze it. Now, there are some plants that grow only in uh, these selenium areas that we call indicator plants. And if you see them growing in your pasture, you know then that the selenium is present in the uh, surrounding areas and will in fact be uh, picked up by the, uh, by the grass. And you can see this cow out here is grazing grass. Uh, this is high in selenium. The uh, plant in the foreground only grows with the presence of selenium. It happens to be a two-groove milk vetch. But the association between that indicator plant and the grass is that the grass will also have um, high levels of, of selenium. Help. Sorry for the interruption there. We'll be back in a second. There we go. Thank you. Okay, so the, the plant that you may have seen, uh, in fact, landscaping companies sell it as a uh, useful plant in xeriscaping. It's quite attractive. This is Prince's Plume. And it is a uh, native plant, but it loves selenium. So if you see it growing in your pasture, you know that the grass has plenty of selenium. There are others. Woody aster, very common on the west part of the state. But it only grows in alkaline, selenium-rich soils. So if you see it growing, recognize it. Uh, most animals won't eat it, but the grass in the area will also contain selenium. So what are the signs of selenium poisoning? Well, usually what we see in horses are these uh, circular cracks on the hooves. Usually um, on all four feet, they may start out as uh, circular ridges, and then as the uh, hoof grows out, these crack about midway down, and uh, they can cause quite severe lameness. And so what happens is that when you take too much selenium in, these animals have the selenium displacing sulfur from the uh, formation of keratin, which is the main protein that forms the hoof wall or the hair. And uh, consequently, you get this weakened area in the hoof. And under the uh, weight-bearing pressures, it tends to crack and uh, cause the lameness. More examples here. Um, Often the, the tail hairs all break off at about the same level, and the main hairs all break um, at about the same point. And so these are very characteristics of chronic selenium poisoning as a result of eating forages um, in high selenium areas. Again, just some examples. Now, not all ridges on the hoof can be attributed to selenium. Uh, some horses that founder get laminitis may do the same thing. So it would be important to differentiate between the two. 
But if you've got the tail hairs all breaking off, as you see in that left-hand picture, uh, you wouldn't see that with laminitis, uh, more typical of chronic selenium poisoning. Best thing to do if you're concerned about it and you've got symptoms in your horse, uh, you can have the hay analyzed. Uh, anything above five parts per million would be a potential risk uh, to animals that are eating it over a period of time. Uh, one can prevent problems um, with selenium toxicity if it's present in the pasture or in the hay by feeding um, minerals uh, that contain extra sulfur and copper. Now you don't want to add selenium to the mineral. So again, if you're purchasing minerals, read the label and make sure there's not added sulfur and uh, added selenium in there. Um, if you have pastures high in selenium, or your horses are being affected, and perhaps the easiest thing to do is make sure your horses have some alfalfa in their diet, because alfalfa has high sulfur. Um, it contains amino acids that are high in sulfur, and it counterbalances then any selenium they may pick up from the grass in the pasture that they're grazing if you're in one of these high selenium areas. All right. Um, Some of the questions I'll answer at the end here, but selenium is a trace element found in the soil. High doses are toxic. Is this true? Yes. Um, I mentioned there, if it, some grasses accumulate a lot of selenium, uh, they will cause poisoning. Um, so that hopefully will answer that. Um, moving on here to uh, photosensitization. Uh, this is a problem that affects all our domestic animal species that uh, graze certain plants. Uh, you can see a horse here with uh, dermatitis on the nose, uh, typical of photosensitization. Uh, some of these can be very severe. You can see a horse here that is literally sloughing all the white skin off uh, its body. So paint horses can have quite severe manifestations and the the, hair, the hide here is almost like it's been tanned. It's dry and completely dead, sloughs off leaving the, the skin bare underneath like you, like you see. Note the brown skin or the pigmented skin is not affected. That pigment is extremely important in protecting the, the underlying skin from the ultraviolet light that uh, hits the white skin and uh, results in this plant-induced uh, severe sunburn, if, it, if you were. Uh, and there's two plants that are of prime importance in Colorado uh, that will cause this. The first one is Senecio or groundsel. And uh, this is a native plant. It's not a introduced weed. There's many different species that grow here nat naturally. And um, usually they're yellow in uh, appearance, often start flowering in the late summer. Uh, and they are uh, characterized by the fact that they have a, in the picture on the left there, you see this uh, single layer of, of green structure, or bracts. This is very typical of the uh, Senecios. A dandelion, for example, has multiple layers, but this single picket fence-like structure of the bracts here is, is typical of the uh, Senecios. And the Senecios, um, again, are quite common in Colorado, and they contain uh, pyrolizidine alkaloids. Uh, and these alkaloids are present in all parts of the plant. Uh, they remain present in the dried plant. So again, in the hay, they can be a, an issue. Uh, these are uh, different species of them, occur at, uh, in different areas, particularly at higher altitude. And, and uh, for all intents and purposes, consider them poisonous and not desirable to have in, uh, in one's hay or any quantity in the pasture. Note again, they have to eat a fair amount of it. So uh, 
a single plant is not an issue, but if they're eating hay that's heavily contaminated, these alkaloids cause irreversible liver damage. So the senecios are one to be on the lookout for. The other is hound's tongue. And uh, this is a weed introduced from Europe that has uh, now spread wide, widely throughout much of North America, especially in Colorado, New Mexico, Wyoming. And uh, the first year it comes up as a rosette of leaves like you see on the left there. The second year it sends up a, a flower spike and it has these red uh, maroon colored forget-me-not like flowers. And many of us uh, perhaps have encountered this plant not knowing it because the seeds um, stick to your clothing or for that matter to horse hair and, and uh, wildlife. And in fact many of our deer and elk have done a very efficient job of transmitting these uh, burrs, these seed, these nutlets that are covered with Velcro, so they stick to everything far and wide throughout uh, much of our mountainous uh, rangelands. So this plant also contains these pyrolizidine alkaloids. Uh, uh, once the animal eats them, these alkaloids uh, are absorbed from the intestine and they end up in the liver and over time they cause permanent damage. The liver becomes fibrotic, not unlike a, an alcoholic, uh, alcoholic's liver which becomes all fibrous tissue and can't function normally. And what happens in these horses then or cattle that eat these weeds, um, the liver cannot metabolize and remove chlorophyll uh, or in particular this phyloerythrin which is the breakdown of chlorophyll. And consequently, instead of it being passed out in the bile, incidentally, this is what gives bile its yellowish green color, um, it accumulates in the blood. And of course, it circulates in the skin. And in the presence of UV light, actually fluoresces in the skin. And the fluorescence kills the blood vessels. Consequently, the skin dies and sloughs off and appears as a is a severe sunburn, as you see here. And here's some examples. Again, it's classical to be only the white skin. The brown skin is unaffected. It could be on the legs, the face, uh, anywhere there's white skin. And um, this is what it appears uh, superficially uh, to you when you first see it. Again, on the left, horse with photosensitization. Um, it's important to have your horse checked by a veterinarian if you suspect this because if the animal is losing weight and especially if it has a yellow um, sclera or the whites of the eye are yellow like this instead of a white or light pink color, uh, this indicates they've got jaundice or icterus which is a direct reflection of liver disease. And unfortunately, if the liver is damaged, um, you get 80% or more of the liver damaged, the horse will die. Um, unfortunately, we don't do liver transplants at this point in time, but that's what would be necessary to uh, uh, save an animal with that much liver damage. So it's irreversible. And so anytime you see photosensitization, be sure to have it checked. A veterinarian can take... Um, blood test and, and uh, evaluate the function of the liver. No treatment once they get to this stage. All right, a um, couple of things uh, to look for in hay. We've mentioned these, milkweeds. Uh, break open those bales and check them out. Um, if you see milk pods, you know, clean them out. Don't feed them to your animals. Hound's tongue is often... Uh, in hay meadows, it spreads readily, as I say, by animals and people and wildlife. And uh, it can easily get baled in hay. And actually, it's quite palatable once it's dry, less so when it's still uh, green. And again, the ground soles or senecios, again, can be in hay meadows and uh, can end up in the hay. And these are things to be on the lookout for. 
few things to finish up with. Uh, perhaps you've got a horse that's salivating, uh, drooling, having difficulty eating, and so you look in the mouth, and the, the first thing you see is this very dramatic ulcer right here on the upper lip. Uh, you can see uh, lesions around the teeth like this, another ulcer over here, and uh, one immediately gets concerned. Uh, and this is due, in fact, to um, grass orns. Uh, grasses, some of the grasses we get growing here, especially in overgrazed pastures, uh, you can see here this grass taking over. And this is foxtail barley, or just foxtail. These are the orns, and uh, if they're in hay in particular, they get embedded in the gums and produce uh, these uh, very distinctive ulcers. Here's a different grass, one of the ceterias, um, we'll just called foxtail. And these little brownish orange hairs are what stick into the gum and produce these, um, uh, these ulcers. Now I'd have to, it'd be remiss of me to fail to mention this, just because you have an ulcer in the mouth of a horse could be due to other things. Um, could be due to uh, a bit injury, for example, like on the dorsum of the tongue here. But at this time of year uh, in Colorado and throughout the summer, any time you have ulcers in the mouth or a horse is salivating, we have to be aware of the fact that it could be a virus disease called VS or vesicular stomatitis. And this is a disease that comes in often from uh, Central America spreads up through New Mexico. They've had a few cases this summer uh, so far in New Mexico. And uh, so we have to be on the lookout for it in Colorado. Uh, and it would present much like a horse with grass horns. Uh, and again, your veterinarian could be the best person to uh, help you differentiate and, and uh, deal with the, you know, either problem. I had to throw this picture in, um, not that I think many of us grow these plants here, but this is a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, par parking a nice uh, team of horses there with the carriage attached uh, right next to this shrub here. And uh, this board horse munching on this would have to eat only about uh, half a pound of these uh, to be fatally poisoned. And um, some of you may recognize it as you. Uh, Yews are extremely poisonous. Um, I see uh, nurseries selling these, and uh, people like to grow them. They form nice hedges. Uh, they uh, are, are nice to plant around enclosures. And uh, if they've got animals in it, it's a high risk. Uh, they're highly poisonous to cattle. Uh, to all animals, and so I certainly do not advocate using you um, as a hedge or anywhere near where horses can browse on it. Um, they remain green all winter, and so they are attractive uh, at all points of the year and are highly poisonous. Again, no treatment for it. Best to be on the lookout to avoid any uh, risk of it. Um, getting near to horses. So, giving you a, a summary of some of the, the more common uh, plants that we might contend with in, in Colorado. Um, as I mentioned earlier, most poisoning occurs from neglect of what's being fed or overgrazing. Um, and again, keep in mind that they've got to eat a lot of these plants in most cases, with the exception of water hemlock, which is a uh, highly poisonous native plant that only takes a mouthful or two to uh, fatally poison an animal. I uh, will draw your attention to uh, a book and a website uh, that you're welcome to use. This website is available on the extension page or um,
Good. Sorry, we're we're back again, and and uh, so I what I'd like to do is um, answer some uh, questions that have been typed in here, and uh, any others that uh, may come up as as you think about it. Um, and I'll start out by just going down the list. Actually, there's uh, I think milkweed is a good butterfly habitat. Uh, yes, it is. It is, however, a narrow-leafed milkweed and uh, certainly could be a problem if it became invasive in a pasture. Uh, Lookweed, does that make the animals act crazy when eaten? Uh, again, yes, they act abnormally. Loco meaning crazy in Spanish, so they're very unpredictable. Uh, they may act blind, they walk in circles, they run into fences, uh, they rear over backwards, all uh, very unpredictable type behaviors that uh, can be induced by loco weed and as I mentioned by uh, eating sage. Again, sage is reversible, loco weed poisoning is not. Any concerns with Canada thistle? Uh, no, it is not poisonous. Um, it is a concern, however, because it's invasive and displaces the good forages you'd like to encourage in your pasture. So yeah, control it. Um, otherwise, it will uh, take over. Um, let's see. A lot of nutritionists indicate that selenium is a cancer preventative in trace amounts. What do you think? Uh, it is essential for normal health in trace amounts. It affects the health of muscle, heart muscle, skeletal muscle. If you have deficiency in it, it certainly causes muscle weakness, and in young animals can be fatal. So uh, in our part of the country, we don't feed extra selenium, because it's usually plenty in, its, in the plants that are growing in the soils here. In California, on the East Coast, they add selenium because they tend to have deficient soils. I can't speak to how effective it is in cancer prevention, however. Are used poisonous to humans as well? Yes. Don't add them as salad greens. They're highly poisonous. What is the uh, toxicity of field, bind field bindweed or convolvulus? Again, usually not a problem unless that's all they've got to eat. And where I've seen a problem is in when hay is filled with bindweed, particularly the seeds, uh, and the seeds have alkaloids that cause colic. Uh, so I mentioned at the beginning the cleaning out the feed bunk because they tend to gravitate to the bottom of the feed bunk and the, and the bottom feeders tend to get the seeds, chew them up and get a pretty severe colic from it. Leafy spurge, uh, it's mildly irritating. Uh, most of the time animals won't eat it with the exception of sheep and goats, which uh, actually like to eat it and do quite well in helping to control it. But horses, um, yeah, if they're starving, they'll eat it. They'll salivate. They might get some diarrhea, but it's not going to be a fatal uh, toxicity. Russian knapweed is not poisonous to uh, uh, any animals except horses. So sheep and goats can graze it. In fact, I know people who use it as a biological control. Is lupin poisonous to horses? Um, generally not, unless they're getting to eat the seeds and if there's a, a, a fungus growing on it. But in Colorado, we tend not to see much of a problem with that at all at this, uh, in this area. Uh, is lupin poisonous? I found the best way to control Canada thistle is by regular mowing. What do you think? Um, yes, if you can uh, prevent it going to seed, and uh, deplete the energy resources of the plant. Uh, it is less vigorous. Other grasses can compete with it, and uh, you can knock it back. But you'll never win entirely. You give up, give up, and it'll come back on you. It's got an extensive underground root system, but you can certainly manage it the way you indicate. If it rains come July, what plant should be looking for if we get really wet, especially around Durango. 
Well, that's a tough question. Uh, it depends what's growing there, uh, but certainly things that might uh, really flourish are some of the senecios, the hound's tongue. Um, you might get a, a regrowth of some of the uh, uh, plants like, uh, well, probably not things like the uh, death camus and water hemlock, but if they hadn't come up in the early spring, they might reemerge if the rains uh, came later. What about kosher weed? Um, a common weed. Horses graze on it quite regularly. Um, may cause some digestive problems and colic. And one interesting thing I've seen with it is, uh, particularly in late summer, it will accumulate a lot of uh, sulfate. And uh, horses grazing the kosher will develop black tongues and black teeth. It doesn't seem to cause much else. Um, and it's because the sulfates uh, make this black precipitate that stains the teeth and the tongue. But uh, I've seen an awful lot of horses eating kosher weed without any problem, and, uh, and they do quite well on it. Um, so I've not really had any other issues with it. Fescue with endophytes. Uh, yes, that's becoming a, an increasing concern because more people are bringing in fescue um, that has endophyte in it. And uh, it is not a plant to feed pregnant mares because it was, will cause a lack of milk production, prolonged uh, pregnancies, uh, difficulty falling, retained placentas. And uh, the important thing then is if you've got tall fescue, pull the mares off the pasture at least three months before they're due to fall. Uh, Non-pregnant mares and other geldings and so forth uh, seem to graze it without any uh, particular problem. My songbird eat the seeds of Canada thistle. Uh, they also help to spread it. That's true. Not near as much, of course, as uh, the wind that will distribute the, uh, the seeds. Um, so hopefully the birds will digest some of the seed. How about kinnikinnik? Uh, not poisonous that I'm aware of. And um, again, it's a native shrub. You see it up in the higher uh, elevations. And um, I don't know of any poisoning from it. What about cheatgrass? It has, take, it has taken over my pasture. Is it poisonous? Uh, it is not poisonous. It, however, has quite sharp grass horns, and you might get those same uh, ulcers developing in the lips and gums if that's all the horse has got to eat, or if it's uh, a main constituent of the, the hay that might be fed. Um, it is controllable by herbicides. I encourage you to, to talk to your uh, weed specialist in the area. Uh, you need to spray it very early in the season because it tends to germinate uh, even during the winter, and that's a good time to control it. Any other questions? While we're waiting, why don't we bring up the poll, see how the audience feels about their knowledge now after Tony's presentation. What do you think? How much have you learned? Well, I'm glad that uh, some of you have gained some, in, some more knowledge there. Um, please use my website uh, if you want to look up things. And again, I encourage you, if you've got a plant that you want identified in your pasture, most of us nowadays have uh, digital cameras. Uh, take a few pictures and send them to me, and I'd be happy to identif identify them for you and let you know if they're poisonous. And uh, uh, certainly my book is a got a lot more plants in it there that uh, we didn't cover today that uh, are is a resource for you if you want to look up other toxic plants. All right, well, thank you. So I guess we'll end here. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you all. And thank you, Tony. <laughs>